the question I get every now and then, especially when I got back from 2016 Olympics and a lot of people, and people wanted to know, what is it? What is it? What is that thing that makes the difference? What's that thing I need to do that, that just puts me over the edge that makes the difference? Welcome to Champions Mojo Weekly Podcast, where your hosts Kelly Palace and Maria Parker share with you what it takes to be a champion. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds Masters World and National Swimming Records, and Maria holds world records in endurance cycling, and was the overall women's winner of the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. They'll be sharing their personal stories and wisdom, along with interviewing other champions to give you the tools you need for becoming a true champion in your own life. And now, your host, Kelly Pallas. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo podcast. And as usual, I am co-hosting with Maria Parker. Maria, hi. Hi, Kelly. Maria, today is one of the interviews I have been looking forward to with great excitement. Our listeners are going to hear from one of our most innovative, cutting-edge, most successful swim coaches in the history of the sport. We're also going to talk about changes that this great coach has been through, something called cultural adjustment, and just really get down to business with finding out what Olympic head women's swimming coach from the 2016 Olympics, David Marsh, has been up to. Coach Marsh certainly knows a lot about change. He's had the most successful prior to his Olympic coaching at Auburn. He was the most successful college coach in history. That record has now been broken, but he was in the likes of Bear Bryant, John Wooten, the winningest NCAA a coach ever, which is what he's mainly known for other than being the Olympic coach. But Dave is all, David has also done a lot of amazing innovation in being the first coach to start uh, pro swimming, elite swimming. And I'm going to stop talking and let him kind of explain, you know, everybody's very excited about what David Marsh is up to. So first, let's say David Marsh, welcome to Champions Mojo. Yes, David, welcome. Well, thank you. And that's a, a very nice introduction. I appreciate it. And I've, I've enjoyed you guys and your podcast. And I think you do a great job of sort of digging in with folks. And, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the, the conversation and happy to share, as I've always been a very open coach with uh, with my thoughts and, and uh, ideas. I, 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 I'm looking forward to sharing this with you guys. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So I was fortunate enough to coach with you in the SEC during your dynasty. Mm -hmm. So give us a little bit for, for those youngsters who who aren't maybe as uh, as mature as I am. Give us kind of your step by step what you have done coaching wise since you left Auburn. Well, since I left Auburn, I, I uh, the window of time that I that I've been gone. There was a 10 year window. Where I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, coaching what was originally known as Mecklenburg Aquatic Club, now swim back. And it was 10 years where, when the U S Olympic committee and the USOC really championed by a pioneer named Jeff Gack, who was just inducted into the North Carolina swimming hall of fame, fortunately, and well-deserved. Uh, we came together and came up with the idea of, of having a professional training center put on top of a large club that would, in a perfect world, sort of help raise this big, huge club that was in Charlotte from a sort of a regional, sort of junior national-based team into more of a forward-facing national and even international uh, club. So that was the concept. And in the 10 years, I think that played out beautifully. The club rose to be one of the top clubs every year in Club Excellence Program. And, uh, and then probably more important, we were – uh, constantly at senior nationals and uh, at the uh, international and even Olympic stage with athletes that were not only moved into Charlottesville professionally, but also athletes within the program like Michael Chadwick and Kathleen Baker that came through the, the program as age groupers. And so we're very proud of that window of time. Uh, when I came back from the Olympics, the sort of, we were on our sort of 
the third version of a board of directors and some of the stuff had changed and some of the, uh, co- the, the, I think priorities changed. So sort of gave me a chance to sort of say, okay, what's, what's the next thing after this? And that's when uh, I had been in San Diego the previous couple of years and, and Eva did some scouting out there to try to figure out, okay, if I wanted to be in San Diego and run a pro group, what would that look like? And, and certainly the UCSD pool was one of the, the but the nicest pool for a pro group. So I was able to uh, be offered that position. Uh, that didn't last more than just these two years, but the staff that I had brought out or that was there, uh, Marco Georgievic, and, uh, and the rest of the staff has stayed in place. So that team's going to stay very strong. And the professional group has moved over to the Jewish Community Center, the Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center. And that's what we operate out of now. So I have a, this professional group. We have uh, 19 swimmers in the group right now, most from the U.S., but several in, you know, top international swimmers. And then uh, my wife and I have started a, a small club called Team Elite Stingrays. It's just an age group team. The focus of it is going to be is 11 to 15 year olds, and we're pretty passionate about giving 11 to 15 year olds really what they need at that age, which is fantastic technique. The ability to kick really well and a love of the sport, and I would say that's our sweet spot with this club. And uh, but it's been interesting starting a club because uh, you know I only joined on for with, with Dynamo early in my career, swim Mac when it was rocking and rolling, uh, Las Vegas Gold when I was up and going, and Rowdy had run it. So to start a club from scratch, I actually haven't realized all the all the steps and uh, procedures and policies and, and uh, things like that you got, you got to go through to start that. So uh, God bless all of you out there that are, that are starting clubs. And, but we're, anyway, this is a, a you know, a coach run coach own program. And I think it's allowed, it's going to allow Kristen and I to sort of offer what we're passionate about, maybe not offer what we don't feel passionate about. And I think that's going to be a good, good way to be at this age and stage of my career. And this is going to be a, a club that's owned by you and your wife, right? Yes, it's a it's a club that'll that will have a variety of coaches because we have you know we we'll still have uh, some of the the coaches that came out to San Diego with me working with me and and uh, the team elite athletes themselves that aspire to be coaches or work with children in their sort of next version of their life after swimming. They'll be very involved in working with the the young athletes that'll be on the team, and it's already showed to be a, a, a really good formula as, as the kids are swimming very nice in the water and, and uh, nice progress. But it's really, a, to some degree, a support mechanism for kind of landing a career of philosophy that, that, my, that Kristen, and Kristen, is a, my wife, is, a, is an accomplished coach herself. And, you know, most kids like her a lot more than me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so she's, she does a lot better job. And, and Neither of us will probably be on that deck full time, but both of us will be on the deck often with that group. And as we establish who the head coach will be of the team in, in the next few months, uh, yeah, hopefully be off and running and we'll, it will help uh, San Diego as I, as I felt like I was able to help North Carolina in that window of time we were out in, in Charlotte uh, to grow and, and, and become a, a stronger you know, community of swimming. And that's what, uh, that's what I hope happens where, where I go is that, that the, all boats rise, and, and that's certainly the goal in this case. Can, can you crystallize, David, what, you're, what you and your wife want to, you know, your philosophy? Yeah, the philosophy is, is that and it really comes out of sort of she and I have almost two completely different backgrounds. Hers is, is moving from a, a really a part-time sort of club summer in Chicago to Mission Viejo Natadors at the point where literally was probably that's his highest flying time, highest volume time, highest intensity time. And I was a, a, a person that in 10th grade, when I was cut from the baseball team, I started swimming. So I was in 10th grade. I always t- talk at my clinics and ask the kids who's faster than 123 in the hundred yard freestyle. And every hand in the room raises up. And that was my time in 10th grade when I started swimming so to go from that perspective uh, with hers, it's sort of that combines to understand, first of all, most important is that you love what you do. And it's, sometimes it's hard to love swimming because you're jumping in cold water. You're in a foreign environment. Uh, you have to go somewhere to do it. You're wearing a little Speedo. And, and so it's, it has a lot of ways it can be uncomfortable. So figuring out how to make it more enjoyable uh, have have young people look forward to coming to the pools, literally the foundation of, I think, effective swimming. And then the second thing is 
when you're there and in the proper process, I think my, my opinion is from about 11 years old to 14, uh, you really got to get your strokes down, uh, you know, in, in looking at the history, you know, how strokes turn out as professionals and then looking back at what the swimmers look like when they were 11, 12, 13, 14. Nowadays, you go say something has a lot of the video from when they were on the national junior team and even before. And then as they're pros at, in the mid twenties, the strokes don't change much. So you better get that stroke, you know, with a proper catch, the good kick, the good balance, things like that, pretty much down when you're in that sort of learning age and the mindset's gone from concrete to more, uh, more the ability to handle a variety of thought and delayed gratification, things like that. And it's really a magic time in that window to be developing athletes. So we strongly believe that that's the window of time to the stroke technique should take the forefront and nothing should jump in front of it. And then as you can handle that technique, you train the technique. Uh, there isn't any swimmers that swim, that kick too fast to be a fast swimmer. Kicking is something that everybody can get better at. And, uh, you know, being around Bob Gross, Seth, as I have been for the last uh, several years with Team Elite and with Queens, and he's been out in San Diego a lot, uh, you know, just continue to learn about how to become a kicker. So kicking is almost like its own stroke, if you know what I mean. But foundationally, you see the best swimmers in the world generally also have fabulous kicks. So that'd be another thing. And then, and then just an I am attitude. I believe that young, young swimmers should work on all four strokes really almost all the time. And if you can get that entry into the sport with that love, that combination, uh, I believe that's a foundation where at least good things, maybe great things can happen. That is beautiful. Uh, yeah. Have fun and get technique right when you're young. That's great. Right. And, and I think that there's a there's a book called The, the Talent Code that I've uh, really found is a, is a 100% believe in that. Daniel Coyle wrote it, and it's an outstanding book about the uh, uh, sort of the whole process. And they talk about ignition being one of the real keys. And, and I can remember – with all the Olympians that I've coached and been able to work with over the years, every one of them can sort of harken back to a moment when they felt a, you know, that, that, that this was the difference maker. There was a moment where, uh, whether it was a traumatic moment, uh, you know, I remember, you know, Pat Calhoun talking about his age group coach, uh, you know, being ill and, and uh, that whether, whether it's an inspirational moment, so many athletes put Josh Davis's medal over their, the neck and they they decided that's what they wanted to do to do too, do what josh davis did for me i remember mark spitz you know swimming in the pool and i think man that would be amazing to be him and that ignition moment is so critical to launching an aggressive path towards something that the young person just isn't willing to be without i mean kathleen baker talks about when she sat in the bleachers as an 11 year old watching the olympic trials and her parents talk about she couldn't they couldn't hardly keep her from jumping in the water herself and that really set her ignition for the future so i think the, the, there's a lot of points like that and i appreciate that daniel Coyle, Coyle also emphasizes the master coach me needing to be part of that process and uh certainly you know we'll probably talk about this but i think the more you have done coaching in the years you've uh, you know that i've grown and continue to learn the more I realize I don't know. I don't know a lot of things and I need to keep learning. And uh, that's, that's just part of the process. And, and, and to be a master coach, you know, I think you really have to have a, a lifelong learning mindset and uh, the humility to know that you just don't know it all and uh, have to keep searching for, uh, you know, sort of best ideas. And, and that's certainly what I've, I feel like my career has been, you know, sort of emphasized with. Wow. David, that is that is really gold right there. And I know one of the things that you I'm, I'm not sure if we said it in your intro, but you've coached 49 Olympians. And the year that you were the head women's coach of the Olympics, that was the winningest Olympic swim team that we've ever had breaking winning more medals than we've ever won. Is that isn't that correct? Yes, yeah, so the winning in the most the, certainly most would say within when I have no doubt our 76 men, six men's team in particular was the most dominant combined men and women, and especially the women's side. Uh, we, we did very well. And especially in, in consideration of our Olympic trials weren't amazing. And in fact, if had we gone the times that we did at the trials in 2016, we would have only won 22 
uh, medals, and that would have been one of our worst showings ever. So we needed to improve a lot from the time we swam in Omaha to the time we arrived and, and, partic- and, and competed in in Rio. And we had a lot of adjustments. We ran into you know the Zika virus and had to change our entire training camp plan from Puerto Rico to downtown Atlanta. That was a big shift, and and uh, but this team handled it beautifully. The staff handled it beautifully, and and uh, we were able to sort of cobble together what we need to do to get into Rio and, and get get the job done. So we can't have the Olympic coach on here, and you you've answered definitely the first half of the question. If there are coaches, parents, kids out there listening, how do I get? to the Olympics? How do I get my swimmer or myself to the Olympics on the Olympic swim team? So you've answered a beautiful 11 to 15, work on your kick, you know, be I, have an I am attitude. How about from the perspective of mindset? What would you tell some young listeners or coaches out there? You know, you want to go to the Olympics. What kind of mindset do you think these kids might need? Well, I think honestly, I think there's a, it goes two ways. So one is a mindset that I think you some young people are just born with. Uh, some people are just born with a natural, uh, and sometimes you don't know how it happens because in the same family, there can be a highly, highly competitive uh, son or daughter. And then the other one can be not competitive at all and, and uh, completely different interest. And I think that's what's beautiful about being human being is, is we all have, can follow our passions. And for those that, that sort of come out of the womb competing and only uh, accepting the blue ribbon, uh, you know, more power to them. We shouldn't, we shouldn't subdue them at eight, nine, 10 years old by telling them it's okay to, to, uh, to, to get something they're not satisfied with. At the same time, how they handle it, the manner with which they do, of course, is important that they learn how to be uh, uh, people that are, that are gracious and uh, especially gracious in winning and, uh, and then can handle losing. And, and one of the sayings is, you know, if, if you can't handle not winning, you probably shouldn't participate. So make sure you uh, can handle that. The other side of that is you'll say you're not, you know, sort of naturally as competitive. Everybody has things that motivate them. So it may not be that faster time. It may not be that gold medal, but it may be uh, being a part of a relay team. You know, there, there's several athletes, Nick Shackle and Yoel Brook, and I've had several swimmers that they would have amazing relay splits through their career, but they can never do the individual swims near as well because they were just such team players that, uh, you know, that they, they, that's kind of just how they were wired. So they would do it for the team. And I think that's another way in our sport that even though we're such an individual sport, you can emphasize the team portion in sort of unique ways. And then I think the other part too is, is it just, you know, I think in good, you know, sort of ideal parenting and, ideal coaching uh, when the experience of having uh, given a great effort to the process, not depending on the outcome then, but if you had a great process, uh, part of the reward is positive reinforcement, not uh, necessarily uh, uh, just judgment of how you performed at the biggest meet of that season, but you know, that what's recognized is that there was a, there was a, a, great effort in the process in the course of that season to develop then you have to celebrate that as well so it's not just that did the medal go around my neck but but did i you know become a better kicker during the season did i what did i become more uh, mobile what am i a little bit stronger you know did uh, this is lots of ways to measure improvement and in our sport you know sometimes it's uh it's a uh, it takes a while to keep chopping at the tree before the tree is going to fall and you get the big drop. And, uh, and then you get, uh, in, which in some cases, I know Mark Gangloff, when I was, when I was coaching him, he, he did, we did his best time in a tournament breaststroke in his mid twenties. And he said, you know, that's seven years since I did my best time in that event. And, uh, and sometimes it just takes uh, that kind of uh, uh, diligence and persistence and our sport does teach that, and, and the sport also teaches you if you don't pay attention to your technique and aren't doing the work that's needed, you're not going to get the uh, the reinforcement and the results that uh, that you expected. It will hold you accountable very quickly. Yes. Yeah. So if, if I can just sort of reiterate what you said, you, you know, Kel, the question was about mental, uh, the mental side, and what you're saying is that parents and probably the swimmers themselves should feel good about 
about gradual progress and not necessarily just judge themselves on the on the big meets and that, you know, we, you know, we should look at the long, the long game and the, and that swimmers who look at the long game are more likely to succeed. Would you agree with that? I think athletes in general, that's the case. And I, and I, and, but I, I think there's a, you know, it's sort of like a, as you're being patient, hurry up, you know, and, and I think that <laughs> right now I, I think, you know, what are other ways you can do? Can you figure out a way nowadays with, you know, obviously NCAA coaches have figured out how to, travel on, on, with underwater dolphin kicks like never before. I mean, the times that are going on at the NCAA level are crazy uh, compared to when I was coaching. And uh, it has a lot to do with, with uh, it's not because of, you know, fast swimsuits anymore. It's because they're doing things in the water much faster and they're emphasizing things that, you know, the underwater kicking that uh, are making them a lot faster. Now, unfortunately, the conversions to long course swimming aren't always happening from short course, but I'll tell you what, if we can figure out how to make that move in long course, uh, you know, the, the USA will continue to be radically dominant in, uh, in swimming. But for right now, I would tell you that in, in what my sort of observations that is that uh, there's always ways to improve. You got to be looking for those things. Sometimes there are quiet moments in a pool by yourself, learning how to float a little bit better or learning how to skull a little bit better with a little bit better direction. Sometimes it's deep in the middle of of achy main sets that you you don't want to be in and you you just got to lean into it and make it happen even on the worst of days and i think that you, you need you need a little bit of all that and i think those kind of things over time end up uh paying dividends in terms of uh you know the the, the direction of best times and and those are things you control there's a lot of things we can't control but your effort you can control for sure that's really great. You know, on, on that note, can you tell us a story of a swimmer who's really inspired you with their, well, with whatever story they have, but maybe with their ability to, to do what it takes over a long period to succeed? Yeah, I think the, you know, when, when I, I sort of think back to Colin, coaching Cullen Jones in a window, window of time, I did coach him. And I felt like he's someone who uh, went through all the phases there are, literally from a from a, a, a young person growing up who almost drowned to a person who uh, had to sort of get the attention of NC State at the right time to get to get to uh, the chance to swim at a great school uh, like that uh, to someone who you know as as a young professional swimmer took the risk of moving down with me in Charlotte and and I, and I tell you that. During all these window of time, windows of time, he was given mixed messages of what his role was, not just because he's African-American. And whenever he'd be walking to an airport, people would ask him, are you a basketball player? They wouldn't ask if you're a swimmer. And, and, and all the way to the point where, you know, the, 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 there was a, uh, you know, always a question as to whether he could do two laps. Could he, you know, could he be on the, the 400 freestyle relay or was he just the 50 guy? And, and of course, he ends up being on. The, the most epic uh, relay there is in the history of the Olympics. It's, I think it's the, the number one Olympic moment, the 400 freestyle relay, when we uh, beat the, the French in Beijing. And, you know, one of the things about Cullen, he, he's one of these guys that when he's training in practice, as much as most of his career, at least that I coached him, he really didn't like practice. You know, he just assumed not come to practice or not do practice. He usually did come to practice, but – even then, uh, what he did like to do is race. So we turned his practices most of the time more into racing. He would drive some of the other sprinters crazy because, you know, he never lost a sprint in practice, at least in his mind. <laughs> he never lost a race in practice. If, he, if they touched the wall all together, he knew he touched first. And I think that attitude is something that uh, that, that he was wired with. And, and certainly I, I, I didn't try to – I didn't want to get in the way of – of that that kind of success and and uh the, remember the night he set the american record uh in indianapolis he you know the, the goal wasn't to set the american record the goal was to win the swim off you know he had to you know swim off against gary webergale and uh the american record was the byproduct of that so it was all about racing through his career and i think you just got to find different things that motivate people and then coach them toward that motivation and certainly in, in Cullen's case it was all about racing yes the Colin Jones story is a great one that that's that's a beautiful example so David and Kelly I knew you'd love those wolf pack examples too, yeah they, so I, you know yeah. I, I I I and that was not pre-planned I really just <laughs> it was not pre-planned and one of the 
speaking back about about NCAA coaches, you know, we have talked to many on this podcast and we've already recorded ones that, that aren't out yet. But so many of them, David, you have been their mentor. You, you know, it's amazing these top coaches that you've mentored and their their household names. And I don't want to, you know, go into all of them. But so one of the things that you are such a subject expert in is changing a culture. You know, when you went to Auburn, they were in the cellar. You won umpteen men's and women's NCAA titles. You took that team from the cellar to the top. You, you know, you developed Team Elite at Swim Mac. You, you, you're this pioneer. You've changed culture. You might, some, some might even say you changed the culture of the Olympic team from Omaha to Rio. So could you just talk a little bit about what you think that technique is that you do and and how you do it because that that is the buzzword in college swimming change the culture yeah 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 the uh the the and in another good book by daniel coyle is the, the culture code and i do think that the the culture is the centerpiece and you would have you'd rather have a good culture than a good immediate result because culture will cause the result to uh, repeat and, uh, and, and there's, there's two big parts of culture. One is building a culture. The other, po- the other part is, is maintaining culture once you've built it. And I think the second is harder, honestly. You know, John Wooden talked about that when he was on his amazing run, was that, that you know, it's one thing to climb, but another thing that takes a true character to, to stay on top. And, and, I, and I think, you know, you can get some quick results with sort of uh, aggressive techniques and you can get some quick results with sort of catchphrases and especially nowadays now nowadays with great social media i think the key though is the the big question is what are your graduates how do they feel about their experience what do the uh, the people that are vacuuming the pool the people that are changing lane lines the lifeguards what do they what do they observe? You know, they, and I think that's one of the things you got to look at is what is the the effect you're having on uh, sort of the the whole the whole culture uh, universally. And uh, there are times when you know the, I know early in my Auburn career I you know I did have to take the program somewhat by the throat. And of course that was an era where we were sort of allowed to be uh, a little bit more by the throat with the team and and be more aggressive and. Uh, uh, D- David, what do you what do you mean by by the throat? Can can you elaborate a little bit? Well, I, I just, you know, for me it was really easy because when I came back to Auburn, you know, I had watched the team at SECs the year before, and I was a coach in Las Vegas Gold, and came out to watch SECs, and I just saw the the lack of confidence, the lack of winning posture by the Auburn team, and I was I was a little bit embarrassed by that. I mean, I had been on Auburn teams that finished top uh top 10 you know at NCAAs and we were proud of what we were even though we didn't win anything we were still you know we in our minds that we were winners and uh, they didn't have that kind of at all so when I got back I said look this you know this is going to change this is going to over and for a little while I considered it sort of my Auburn and my uh, mission to make it change and in doing that I, I sort of put everybody on notice that that look, I'm only going to accept, you know, sort of attitudes that are moving forward and are going to be part of the future. You know, the first year I came in, I, I named a freshman team captain because he was our only international swimmer that was accomplished, Ewald Brook. And he ended up, of course, being probably the most influential swimmer that uh, the program had ever ever seen, at least up to, uh, from that point forward. Uh, clearly, Rowdy Gaines over the overall career has certainly been the most influential person in the Auburn swimming history. But the but Yoel Brook, you know, sort of was put in that position because, look, I want you to think like he thinks. I want you to think when you come on this team that I want you dreaming of the Olympics. If you can't handle that and that's not something you can sort of digest, then I want you dreaming of Olymp- at least Olympic trial qualifying. If that's, you know, that's still a little bit too much, then doggone it, figure out a way to score maximum points at the SECs and NCAAs. And that's really the main thing was figure that out. Uh, during that time, let's leave here a better person than, than you came. And uh, in that case, you know, usually that meant uh, trying to make decisions to be a little bit better. You know, in the three big categories, you're an athlete, you're a, a student, and you have a social life. You know, usually you can be, they say, the saying is you can be good at two of the three. 
So we were at really challenging the group to be better at the first two, not so much at the third one. And, uh, and, and to some degree we had to sort of take, uh, uh, Jim Sheridan was my assistant that first year. And we, uh, we weren't beyond going out to the local bars and, uh, and, and looking for folks and, and uh, making sure they weren't out on a weekday. And uh, there, there's some other stories that, uh, that I think the, the, the athletes now inflate a little bit. But, yeah, we, there were, we, we were out there to make a change. It was a little bit by uh, grabbing the program by the throat. And then over time, of course, uh, and I think in about the mid-'90s, uh, you know, with, with guys like Dean Hutchinson and Bill Pilzik and Judy Welting and some of the, these people that were – sort of part of the early years that, that helped us to uh, change it to become the athletes team. And then, you know, when they were voting for the captains, they were looking for people who could lead them to the athletic and team culture success they're looking for. So I think that was one of the big changes was sort of coach led to athlete led. And then eventually it was amazing because it was really tradition led. I mean, there's a moment in time where uh, Pat Calhoun uh, said, you know, his point was, I'm not leaving Auburn without a damn national championship ring. And uh, literally that was the, the, this one particular class, the, the class before them had won four NCAA championships in a row. And then it was a bit of a dry spell or not really a dry spell, just other teams were swimming well. So we weren't winning, you know, every year, but you know, he, he wasn't on a winning team yet. He said, no, I'm not leaving here without my ring. And really the, 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 the history of the team and the tradition of the team really carried it. Uh, the secret behind the scene things that really made it for me, and especially as a coach that, that uh, you know, I have a limited capacity, you know, in what I can do, uh, was to have staffs that were amazing. I mean, my, my staffs, uh, I learned I wasn't uh, a, a great coach at uh, distance, let's say. I had Ralph Crocker, who was, I hired one of the best, you know, coaches there could be, you know, God bless him. And he's in heaven now, but he's a, uh, he was, he took uh, the distance group and we were able to recruit people like Adrian Bender and Haley Pearsall and uh, develop NCAA champions in those events. And, and at the same time, you know, Mike Bottom was on my staff very early. Uh, Dave Bottom was on the staff and then Mike came as a graduate assistant, uh, sort of, sort of uh, just wanting to explore if he wanted to be a coach. And clearly, almost immediately, I saw that he was a very talented coach and passionate about sprinting. And I, you know, let him have a lot of leeway with the sprinters, and he just crushed it. He did amazing stuff with them early on. Really set the the uh, first coach I know of that did did the things he did. And pretty much almost every college program is more or less doing the power program that Auburn used to do back then and that we evolved through, you know, the years where Adam Schmidt was there and Dave Durden and a lot of the other coaches that, uh, that led that. So David, you are such a resource for coaches. Many people call you and you consult with them. You're also the professional advisor to the Israeli national team and for the 2020 Olympics. So it it sounds like that uh, you're you're going to be doing some consulting. Can you share with us what that looks like? Uh, yes, I, I definitely have found in my sort of career as a coach, as I've worked with different athletes, and especially as athletes have moved on to the next phases of life, that uh, you know I love sort of being in the loop with them and encouraging them, networking for them and with them, and uh, and connecting. Uh, I certainly. Feel one thing that gives me a lot of energy is, is sharing what I've learned, and I think like most people that have uh, that are in my stage and age and, and uh, position, I think we've learned more from our mistakes than what we did right. But uh, in that, uh, I have a lot of uh, sort of accumulated experience, and that can turn into to helping folks to perhaps get off to a good foot and maybe not make some of the mistakes that I made or. Uh, maybe make choose to with purpose to make some steps that uh, otherwise they may not have. And I think the the unique thing that my experience is sort of at the end of the day, at the end of everything, and it's a question I get every now and then, especially when I got back from 2016 Olympics from a lot of people. And people wanted to know what is it? What is it? What is that thing that makes the difference? What's that thing I need to do? That, that just puts me over the edge, that makes the difference. And my uh, answer I came to, and I really would, would have loved to find 
you know, that list of three of the top 10 reasons why, you know, those kind of things. But the reality is it's everything. It's literally everything that impacts. It's every person that's in the culture, whether it be the athletes, the coaches, the trainer, the diving coach, the age group coach, the parents and where they're sitting, the front office, the uh, janitors, the, you know, all those things affect the culture. And then the complicate matters, almost all the decisions they make affect it. And so the answer is simply everything. And, and if you can sort of break down things and uh, what, what I challenge, you know, when I, when I do advise, consult, I challenge, uh, you know, like John Maxwell says, begin with the end in mind. Literally imagine where you are at the end and you've accomplished what you've accomplished. And then go backwards and try to think of what were the steps that I did well to get there. Why are we getting to do this? Why are we standing on top of the NCAA podium? Why am I standing on the podium at the Olympic Games? You know, how did I get this, you know, this uh, the six-figure income? You know, wh- what are the things that did that? And then, ha- you know, understand the, the purpose and reason behind it. And I think everyone will say, uh, you know, had to do with so many of the little nuances I did, I, I did or a connection with someone that I never thought would make a difference. You know, in the case of swimming, it could be, you know, a, a visiting coach. And I have Rick DeMont come to the pool deck now in San Diego. And he's given some stroke drills that I never would have thought of. And it unleashed and unlocked, like Marius Kusch, uh, finalist at World Championships from Germany. He, he learned a freestyle drill that, that really unlocked him in his technique. And so it may not come from the the direct coach or even even a full time staff member, but it may come from the 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 ability and really blessing you give to an athlete to be able to learn from sort of multiple sources and then have their primary coach and the athlete sort of figure out what's of highest value. So I do think that in the consulting role, uh, that that is sort of how I see it is is examining the everything. And then trying to chunk it into a few bigger categories, making sure that the categories that you need to be really good at are taken care of thoroughly, and then uh, backfill it with, okay, is this going to be a repeatable process? So in Israel, for example, we're having some really nice results right now at the uh, at the, at the recent World Championships. Uh, uh, some really good results there. Junior Europeans, uh, some events like that. So things are coming along well. But if there's not coaching education going on in the country and there aren't coaches that are more excited, there aren't athletes that more athletes that are swimming, then the rise will not continue. It'll just sort of flatten off a couple of, of the talented athletes that are coming through right now. So we've got to look at it that way. And, and then when it comes to you know, college consulting and you know, the, the big chunk there is, you know, are you taking care of your current team? Are you taking care of making sure administration is is uh, in line with you or you're in line with them more like? Uh, and then thirdly, are you recruiting? I mean, is, is your image and branding and recruiting uh, at the cutting edge and at the at the highest level it can be? And those are big chunks that you have to take care of in college. So I think the difference is, you know, is a person who just sort of gives advice so, and take a lot of phone calls or have a lot of people on the deck with me that, that I certainly give advice. That's sort of my two cents worth. And, and then there's a level at which, you know, I, I'm more of a mentor. And those are normally for people I've been around for a long time or I coached them more. I was in a, you know, they were one of, uh, my, you know, the assistant coaches I worked with. And then that's more of a mentoring role, which I love and cherish right now. But the consulting is more intentional. And I, and I obviously can't consult with too many different organizations. But uh, if I had, you know, two colleges and two clubs, let's say, that would be a, a, a nice uh, – a number to work with in terms of consulting and in that consulting role, really the job for me, at least in my mindset is, is that, is that yes, you give the advice, but you also follow up with the feedback and the structure and, and, uh, and be available for uh, an, an ear and advice when key decisions are being made. And, and I believe in that role, uh, I think a consultant can be valuable. Uh, advice is always nice but consulting can, can have a value at another level. Sounds like you have a, a lot to offer as a consultant, especially with your 
experience and you've been, as you've described it, you, it sounds like you've thought very clearly about what you want, how you want to do it. So I, I think those organizations that you're working with are really fortunate. I'd like to ask you a little bit about, I'm sorry, David, I'd like to ask you about your family. Uh, I know that you have a, an elite uh, swimmer as a daughter, and I'm just sort of curious how you balance everything you do with your family. Uh, yeah, it's been fun watching Alyssa come up the uh, the rankings. I, I would, you know, I think she would tell you that this is probably the first summer she felt like an elite swimmer. Uh, you know, in terms of the the level she was able to train it with in practice, and you know, she's actually able to train pretty well with Kendall Stewart, and when she was in her backstroke working with. Uh, Allie Deloof and and so she was able to sort of be in the mix with them sort of toe-to-toe in practice so I think the first time she's ever felt that way because I, I kind of sort of chuckle because uh, you know Liz was, was sort of the last person that I brought to team elite type groups when when I was coming through Charlotte because she was actually a late starter she was a gymnast before a swimmer and you know sort of knowing what I know about swimming now and knowing sort of big club culture you know, once you get into the group full on, you're sort of, you can tend to get stuck in big club culture where, you know, you've got a group of 30 or 40 kids and they're sort of training all together and, and needing to hit a certain number in the, in the volume and, and uh, the personalization sort of can be hard to do. Uh, and I also knew that gymna- gymnasts end up turning into good sports people in all kinds of sports. So fortunately, our girls like gymnastics and Alyssa when she got to about level six, by the way, level six is when I tell folks that's the time to move them into swimming when they hit level six before they start doing backwards movements on the balance beam and getting injured, move them on over to swimming. And that's what, we did. That's what Alyssa did. And, and uh, fortunately she had, you know, just great coaches. And, and it's funny cause she, she had all female coaches until she got to college. And uh, Pam Swander was probably her coach for the longest uh, period of time, but, but uh, all along she had some, terrific role models as women and, and uh, also uh, outstanding coaches that gave her sort of what she needed uh, along the way. Uh, but I, th- I think that one of the things about being a father of a swimmer is, you know, my, I always felt like my role was to, just to help her when she asked for help uh, and not to sort of force my way in other than hiring the coaches that work with her. You know, the, I think I was able to hire coaches that, that, that I felt like would be coaches that would first of all be a great impact on my daughter as a human being. Secondly, uh, they had the, the the knowledge or the will to learn the knowledge to you know help her and the rest of the group be as good as they can be. So it wasn't until she went to college that I actually coached her at all, and she did see a lot of you know Kathleen Baker and others move over during high school when we were in Charlotte and swim with me on a regular or semi-regular basis uh, before that. And, and even though her times were at Olympic trial levels and junior nationals and things like that, her training ability wasn't uh, really her training need wasn't that level. Her training ability wasn't that level. So she was, she was getting all the training she needed uh, in, in Pam Swander's group. And so there was not uh, uh, sort of, we agreed the, the need to sort of move her uh, to the elite experiences that uh, a lot of the other uh, high school kids were able to get at that point in time back uh, back when I was there at Swim Mac. So I think that's the beginning of it. And, and just in terms of uh, being the father of a daughter that is now a very good swimmer, she's also been in a lot of uh, in the car with me a lot when we were driving with our one hour each way commute to, in, in Charlotte. She would hear a lot of my conversations with assistant coaches and elite athletes and other coaches around the country. So she's fast forwarded and probably the overall knowledge of, of uh, coaching, uh, hopefully most of the time with, with really good information, occasionally probably stuff that she didn't need to hear. But, uh, but yeah, back, back to my family, the, you know, my family is a swim family. You know, my wife, as I said, is an you know, excellent coach. And, and even though she hasn't pursued it, you know, through her career full time, she's, you know, she's spent uh, a lot of time on the pool deck, uh, with some of the better clubs in Southern California before she came to uh, Auburn and then uh, raised three great kids and, and, and then, you know, has been on the deck with coaching masters. She coaches wind and sea masters in San Diego right now. And, 
And this, as I said, helping out with the Team Lake Stingrays with getting that up and going. So we're a swim family. Uh, my youngest daughter swam until she went to Auburn. She's a sophomore at Auburn now, but she uh, <clears throat> wasn't, you know, that level of swimmer to swim at a place like Auburn. And she was going to go to Auburn no matter what, because that's where all her BFF was. And that was her, her, her dream, her whole life. And she's doing fabulous there. As what she calls, she's, she calls herself a NARP. A uh, non-athletic regular person is the thing apparently that <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they call themselves. But she and then my son just graduated from Queens University of Charlotte, had a great experience, uh, but never liked swimming, but that was willing to swim on mom's high school swim team. My wife started uh, the high school team at Pine Lake Preparatory, and they didn't have a team before that, nor a track team. And she started a track team there as well. So uh, so as an as a athletic family and a swim family, uh, that's been one of the, the cornerstones of our family. You know, our faith has been another cornerstone of our family. And then, you know, and I think the, the, the third thing is we just, you know, the active lifestyle. We, we really believe in, in uh, sort of exposing the kids to travel and, and uh, doing a lot of things outside. And certainly cities like Charlotte and San Diego are, uh, have a lot of, uh, of opportunities like that. In fact, you know, my daughter and I, uh, Maddie during her senior year in high school when she was out there for one year in San Diego we uh, we both took up surfing and uh, it really was my excuse to spend time with her out there in the waves and and uh, but we you know it was a it was a lot of fun and I'm really going to cherish that year for the rest of my life that, uh, that we got to spend uh, sitting out in the water waiting for the next wave that is so that cool. Is cool and that's like that's like our third interview person on our podcast that loves surfing isn't that wild yeah, well, it's water. Out there. Yeah, Summer Sanders, it's Michael water Andrew. Not, yeah. and, and the wave doesn't work for you if, you if you learn how to do it well. You get a, and, and I found out if you get a long enough board that floats really well, pretty much anybody can stand up on it. It's not Surfing is not, not all probably used to be when the, when the board's quite a bit smaller. Well, you've got great waves out there in Southern California, so that's that's a, one of the advantages of the West Coast. East Coast, we don't have that that great of waves. My husband's a surfer and, but wonderful. Well, David, we want to be respectful of your time. Um, we, so I could, you know, we could talk with you all day. I, I do want to ask you one last question, which is if, is there anything that we have not covered that you would like to, to talk about? Well, I, I feel like in, in an interview like this, where I did some reflecting and, and even this point where I'm at the end of the interview, I don't feel like I gave enough credit or credibility to the, to the, to the many assistant coaches and, and partners in coaching that I've had, because that's why, you know, if, if I'm a, you know, a, a high level swim coach, I call a fancy pants coach at this <laughs> point, it's because of the, you know, I've stood on the shoulders of a lot of great swimmers and a lot of amazing assistant coaches, uh, you know, guys that are not with us anymore. Like, you know, Richard Quick was my lifetime mentor, probably the most impactful you know, human being in my life, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of what I wanted to do, I really wanted to be Richard quick. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I think to some degree, I've been able to accomplish some levels of that. Uh, you know, Ralph Crocker, like I talked about my best friend in the world, Jimmy flowers, uh, you know, rest in peace and he's in heaven too. So I got a lot of folks I'm going to catch up with in heaven. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the other guys and, and, and women in particular, I mean, Dorsey Tierney Walker, who just moved over to Ohio State, one of the best coaches I've ever shared the deck with, and uh, Kim Bracken. You know, Auburn doesn't win any women's NCAA championships uh, if Kim Bracken doesn't uh, choose to come from Northwestern down to Auburn. And, and as fate would have, have it on her flight back on her interview from Auburn to Chicago. There was a special guy on the flight that ended up sitting next to her named Bo Jackson, and uh, <laughs> yes. Bo actually gave gave me a big hand in helping to recruit her to uh, to Auburn at that time. Uh, so I, I'd say you know the the you know the the Dave Durdens, John Hargis's, you know Dave Dennistons, you know the, the, these guys that are just impacting our sport now and will for years and years to come. You know, or the people that sort of delivered uh, a, a message with some a good level of harmony in it in order for us to have great teams and uh, to be able to coach uh, the athletes at the elite and Olympic level. And, and so, so many of those coaches are, are the reasons why we're doing this. And, uh, you know, I just look forward to learning more from them as they continue to grow in their coaching and 
Uh, I have a, a couple of little uh, WhatsApp groups that I that I that I keep, and we we share on different levels with different groups about different things. And and uh, we're, I'm always learning and, and sharing as we as we can with technology nowadays. Well, you're very humble. <laughs> yes, I was going to say that's incredibly humble. David, before we let you go, we, we're adding a new little sprinter round of questions. It's a fun, okay. like, a game show type thing. So we know you, you do put your pants on one leg at a time. And uh, we just... I wear shorts are, mostly out here. Yeah. <laughs> these are just really quick questions. And um, it's kind of a, a one or the other. So I'm just going to say it and you answer. Take your mark. Cat or dog? Dog. Red or blue? Blue. Milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Chocolate ice cream. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Kick, kickboard or no kickboard? Uh, no kickboard. Mountains or beach? Beach. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Coffee or tea? Love coffee. Morning person or night owl? Morning person. Mini golf or real golf? No golf. <laughs> no uh, what's your favorite color orange and blue okay favorite pizza topping oh green peppers oddly enough that's a I good answer it. favorite vegetable answer. uh oddly enough brussels sprouts roasted oh, brussels, my brussels goodness. sprouts yes. not boiled oh, not boiled only, only roasted roasted. only roasted I love it. Your favorite swimming complex in the USA? Uh, my reaction right there is Minnesota. So we won our first national championship and a few after that in 1997. Yeah, that's a nice facility. Something that uh, you listen to on musically that you that relaxes you? Jack Johnson. Ooh, I like that. What's your shoe size? <laughs> Uh, it's 15, uh, 14, except the Nike's 15. Oh my gosh. Your Trouble, favorite yeah. star, your favorite Star Wars character? Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Okay. And the last question, um, do you still swim yourself ever? Hit the water yourself? Uh, only in salt water or when it's very warm outside. Okay. S surfing with your daughter. Yeah. Well, that thanks. That's just a little, little sprint around to to get people to know you a little bit better and that's um, fun yeah thanks yeah so thank you so much david for spending this time with us i i've gotten a ton out of it i i Me hope too. our listeners have it's been yeah. wonderful yeah we really appreciate it well my pleasure my pleasure i know as, as a cyclist marie my uh, sister has got to congratulate her she just finished third in leadville in her uh age oh my group gosh and, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm not the uh, top athlete in the family. My my sister Loretta <laughs> has uh, surpassed me. There's and, a lot. Uh, very there's, proud a, of her. there's a lot of work behind that finish. Excellent. Congratulations to her. That's and, awesome. and Kelly, thank you for the, what you're doing with your podcast. I think you're doing a great job, and I appreciate that you're pursuing me. So I appreciate you yes. getting this done. Yes. And yes. I hope this uh, this this turned out well for all of us. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will thank see you, you on the pool deck. All right. Very good. See all you right. there. All righty. Bye -bye. Take care. So, Maria, wow, what an interview. There is so much great stuff there. And you and I have to come up with just two takeaways each. Yeah. What are yours? That's going to be tough. Dave Marsh is a very wise, wise man. But what I would like to sort of uh, come away with from the conversation was he said a couple of things. Uh, he said early in our early in the interview, he said it takes a while to keep chopping at the tree and then you get the big drop. So basically you got to persevere. You've got to you've got to, you know, keep on chopping. Sometimes you better uh, sharpen the axe because, you know, whatever your axe isn't working very well. And then he said, you, as you're being patient, you got to hurry up, too. So you got to always look for ways to improve. So I, I thought that was that was fabulous. And the second thing that I took away was really related to that, I think. <laughs> he said, uh, he said, what's the thing that makes it, everybody wants to know, what's the one thing that makes a difference, you know, to make a champion? And, and he said, it's everything, <laughs> which is, oh, I know, <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, oh. I think we all want the shortcut. Right. We all want we right. we all want the we want that one thing, the one thing. And, and the one thing is that there's a lot to it. There's everything. And, and when you're chopping at the tree, you might might have to use a different kind of saw. You might have to sharpen your axe. You might have to come at it from a different angle. So those are my takeaways. I know you had some, too, Kelly. 
Yes, Maria. Uh, those are those are great. There, like I said, there there is so much here that if I were if I could have had this interview from a coach like Dave Marsh when I was a young coach at any level, whether I'm a high school coach or a USA coach or a NCAA coach, I you know we are just gonna. For, you know, because we don't want to just repeat the interview in our summary, I really encourage people to go back and listen through because we, when we started to do our takeaways, each of us had like 10 things. So we picked two each to be uh, concise, but I, I, I just had so many things. I would say one of my favorite things is we've, we've asked many of our top coaches and champions, what do they think one of the qualities of a champion is? And I would say... David's humility is just amazing for having coached 49 Olympians for the level that he has reached as he called himself a fancy pants coach. I love <laughs> that. And, you know, yeah, just just the fact that he, you know, has that great attitude and giving his assistant coach, his assistant coaches and everybody that's been on his staffs the credit. You know, just just that. So the, just the fact that this coach who is at this level is absolutely incredibly humble. So I, I loved his humility and just nicest, you know, down to earth guy that you would think you're going to get the, you know, the 2016 Olympic coach and his resume and that, the, you know, that it would have that he would not be as humble as he is. So that was my uh, first one. My second one, really, I was just mesmerized and beautiful topic of how, you know, what are some of the things that make a champion? And that is those quiet moments, the quiet moments when you're thinking, did I perform like I wanted to? Or, you know, how am I going to get to where I want to go? And I just loved when he said, you know, when you're in the pool sculling, you know, when you're swimming underwater. So those quiet moments when you can evaluate and kind of give yourself time, almost like a meditation because things come to you, you know, in meditation. But there, again, we could go on and on. I don't want to do that. It's been a nice long interview. Get your own notepad out with a pen yeah. and go over these things. And and I think we always do. Yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, just, just make your own list of takeaways because there are so many. And uh, I'm going to segue right into what I'm going to come out of here with is it's going to be my second one, like our, our, our action items for me. I'm going to take some of those quiet moments, some of the, the moments that, you know, I might be grinding on something else, but just take that quiet moment and think about what I could be doing to be better. Yeah. How about you, Maria? I, I like that. I'd quiet the noise. We talk about that a lot. It's really, really hard in a noisy, distracted world to get those moments. My my takeaway actually comes from the idea of a consultant. Um, he... I loved his description of the service he's going, he is providing to swim coaches and swim teams. And it made me realize that having somebody come in from the outside with other things, with some, with my business and with other projects that I'm working on to give me sort of a new spark or a different idea might be really helpful. So my, my action item is going to be to pursue that. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been so enlightening for me. I'm so glad you're on this journey with me, Maria. And this is a, another wrap. Thank you, Kelly. I love it. Great. Great job, Maria. Love you. Love you too. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. Bye. This week's quote of the week comes from us from David Marsh. The culture is the centerpiece. You'd rather have a good culture than a good immediate result because culture will cause the result to repeat. We are so grateful that you spent this time with us today, and we hope that you heard something that inspired, motivated, and educated you. Signing off for myself and my champion co-host, Maria Parker, we hope you'll join us again soon, and we know you can be a champion. Thank you for listening, and please see below for a copy of the show notes for any links or important information that we've referenced here. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast designed to make you feel inspired, motivated, and educated. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Also visit championsmojo.com to learn more.